Good morning, good morning. Good morning, Ian. All right. Thanks very much uh, for availing yourself and thanks to Dr. Maramba who's also pre uh, presenting. Uh, we we'll just take the opportunity to just quickly test that you can share your slides. So maybe we'll uh, we'll check with uh, Dr. Maramba if he's ready, since he will be the second pre presenter, to start by uh, seeing if he can share his slides. Dr. Maramba? Dr. Maramba? Hello, hello, Dr. Mashingola. How are you? I'm okay. Yourself? I'm doing well. Yes. I was I, I, I'm sorry about that. So we are just saying, since you are the second presenter, we will start with uh, 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 Prof. Davison. To we we'll start with you, so that when we go on to uh, uh, Glenda, she, she will just will be, remain on on a first slide. Oh, okay. All right. You can try to see if you can. Uh, share the slides. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, you Prakash, how are you? Yes, you can try to share okay. the slides. Okay, let me try that. Greetings, uh, Ian. Greetings, everyone. Greetings, Ian. Greetings. Greetings, everyone. Uh, yeah, we are well. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to another day and uh, looking forward to a fruitful presentation. Sure, sure. So uh, I hope um, all the speaker has already been joined the webinar. Uh, Ayan, please yeah. confirm. Yeah, yeah, yes, only, yes, the speakers have jo joined in. The uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Erasmus who, who join us later on. Okay, so every speakers, they will be having a right to share and sh unshare their screen. In addition, they can mute and unmute themselves. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And we Dr. are Dr. trying Chimura. to see, uh, doc, yes? It's, um, I'm coming, the message is coming, is saying I was disabled participant screen sharing. So right. it's not activated. Uh, all right, uh, 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 Sonia, Dr. Maramba is unable to share. To okay, share let me screen. let me just check from the back end. Every other right. any other speaker is facing same challenge. Please let me know. Oh, uh, all right, uh, 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 Glenda, can you? Also I'm going to try? try now. All right, sorry. So uh, so we see that it is common. Oh, yeah, Glenda can, can share, yes. That's fine. Do you want to see if you can go down? If you can, if you, if you can do a slide presentation and go down, if it's, if it's working. Yeah. You are seeing them well? Yeah, we are seeing them well. Yeah, it's working. Uh, uh, Mr. Marambe, if you can just try now. Okay. Now, can you see it? Yeah, it's about to come through. Yes. Yes, yes, we we can uh, see it now. 
Okay, yeah. You can try to do slideshow and see if they're going down. Okay. Yeah, we can see them well. I, okay. I'm not sure also from the end. Yeah, I, I can see, I can move. I, I'm moving. I can see them um, moving. All right. That's, that's fine. That's fine then. Okay, thank you. So maybe we can allow Glenda to share a slide, a first slide, so that at least she will be the one who will be starting. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead then. Yes. So at least we have four minutes before we start, and we are. We seem to be set, yeah, right? It's on the second, I think. Yes, thank you. All right, Sonia, we, we are set. We will just wait for five to, to start and uh, all is well. Sure, Sean. All right, all right. I can see people are joining. So I would suggest I will wait for two more minutes. We will start um, in next five to six minutes. So um, or, or, the participants. All right. Will, yeah. Or give, or give a few minutes for colleagues to join in. That's fine.
So we'll give a few, a few more minutes to allow colleagues to join. We'll give two or so minutes, but we'll, st we'll start the, uh, the, uh, the, the presentation on time. The first presenter will, will be on time. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be able to start their presentation at five minutes past nine. Uh, we'll just give a few minutes to allow others Okay, good morning. Let me take this opportunity to welcome you to a series which is being put forward by the University of Zimbabwe, the Department of Laboratory Diagnostic and Investigative Sciences, Cape Peninsula University of Technology, Department of Biomedical Sciences, Stellenbosch University Division of Chemical Pathology, University of Pretoria Department of Chemical Pathology in collaboration with the African Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine and Empower School of Health. And this initiative is referred to as uh, the African Consortium of Lab Laboratory System Strengthening having realized that in Africa, we face similar issues and challenges. The, this consortium does put together a series of talks that addresses the issues that we face as lay practitioners in Africa in order to find ways of exchanging uh, ideas, knowledge, skills, so that we continue to build the skill base in Africa. And uh, to the, this week is the lab professionals week, the medical laboratory professionals week. And uh, as, the, as the African consortium of lab system strengthening, we saw it fit that we also discuss uh, another issue is about the medical laboratory career opportunities so that as practitioners in the lab, we remind of our, ourselves of what is available because it's easy when you are in the lab to just uh, be stuck in the routine of processing samples and doing all that you are doing, which is good. But we also need to uh, be able to uh, 
come to the realization that there are also other career opportunities. There are other things that we need also done by laboratory practitioners uh, in order to have a fully functional uh, medical laboratory, uh, which, which, which supports even the, the testing that you, you will be doing as individuals. So hence the importance of uh, this uh, discussion on laboratory career uh, opportunities. And hence, th this would be very handy for one to the practitioners in, uh, in practice. We also need to open our eyes to what is available for us as practitioners and uh, to our students as well, who are our future. They also need to be enlightened of the opportunities or what they can also do in the in the lab. So hence, the, I, I, this is quite an, an important component. Apart from being able to pass the lab specific skills and and uh, and and knowledge, but also career opportunities need to be talked about and. Uh, we need to constantly <laughs> remind ourselves and uh, be willing to learn from one another. And we have uh, brought together a, a, pa a panel and uh, we have Professor Glenda Davison and Dr. Maramba uh, uh, who will do some presentations. And uh, these presentations are so related. So uh, we will have an uh, at, in a fora where we will discuss at the end a roundtable discussion where they will be uh, they and other colleagues will be able to uh, facilitate dialogue as we discuss about the, the medical laboratory career opportunities and uh, so when you have a question feel free to type it in the in the chat box or uh, or to you'll be able to raise your hand at the end and uh, and be able to be addressed at, at uh, on, on your question and uh, we will be starting our first uh, presentation our first presentation will be from professor Glenda Davison on medical laboratory sciences, the future opportunities and challenges. Professor Glenda Davison is the head of biomedical sciences at the Department of Cape Peninsula University of Technology. And uh, she's already uh, logged on a first slide. So Professor Glenda Davison, uh, over to you, um, can you uh, to take us through the medical laboratory sciences, future opportunities and challenges. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And um, thank you, Dr. Mashungura, and uh, thank you once again. Hello? Oh, there's, there's someone who has a mic that's on. Uh, can, uh, 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 Okay. <laughs> no problem. But thank you, Ian, for inviting me. But I'd also like to thank you for driving this initiative. Um, uh, uh, the whole consortium, I think, in the last year, it's achieved so much. And, and it is such a necessary initiative in Africa. And I'd like to thank you and your team for driving it. But today I have been asked to, to talk about medical laboratory science opportunities and challenges. And that is what I'm going to do. And to outline how I'm go, I've sort of uh, addressed this. Um, the first slide, I'm just going to remind you of what we are as a profession. And then I've identified four factors that I believe are going to influence the future laboratory. And we can see them maybe as opportunities. I certainly do. Some people might see them as challenges. 
and other people may see them even as threats, which I certainly don't do, and I'm going to go through each of them. Then I'm going to just end off by saying, how, how should we as professionals adapt to this? What should we be doing? And then we'll leave it open for the discussion panel to take it further. So, medical laboratory science, we're all in this amazing profession. And if I look at it, I think we can say that we perform complex and simple tests on patient samples using sophisticated equipment, but sometimes very simple manual tests as well. And the results of these tests play a vital role in identifying and diagnosing disease, treating diseases, and of course, monitoring disease. And um, I think you can go into the literature and you will see that um, most people agree that around 60 to 70 percent of clinical decisions are based on laboratory tests performed by our profession. So that uh, shows the, the big uh, um, impact that our profession makes on health care. But we don't only do that, we also perform research. We validate new instruments and new methods for laboratories. And very importantly, we ensure the quality of those results. And in fact, I think we're probably the, the most important cog in that wheel, where we ensure that the results we issue are accurate and, maint and we maintain good laboratory practice. And last but not least is training. And I think this is where we come in because we as a profession together are responsible for ensuring that we produce a new generation of laboratory professionals. So let me go to my first opportunity or challenge. And that is the changing face of healthcare and technology. I don't think we can deny it, but the demographics of people all over the world is rapidly changing. So around here in 2022, um, it's estimated we have around 7 billion people on Earth, but we're not going to stop growing. Um, and in fact, in less than 100 years, by 2100, it's estimated that the world will have over 11 billion people. So that in itself is a challenge for healthcare and laboratories, but the demographics is going to change. And I'd like to take you to this graph over here, um, which I got off the internet, and that's very interesting because on the x-axis is the percentage of the world's population that will be over 60 years of age. And the light blue bars are present with time, and the purple is 2050. So you can see here the percentage of the population over 60 years of age in the world is going to more than double in these next few decades. And in Africa, where we are as Africans, you can see we are the youngest continent, which is a great advantage. But even here, our over the percentage of our population over 60 is also going to double. And of course, that presents a whole host of new um, diseases and um, demographics that laboratories will have to tackle. But added to that is urbanization and migration. Now, already I can tell you that in South Africa, around 70% of people are already living in urban areas. And this is going to be uh, become an issue all over the world. People migrate to urban and cities because that's where the growth is and the job growth is. Um, it might not be a healthy place and other problems occur, which again will affect healthcare and, um, and laboratories. And then we come to climate change. I don't think anybody can deny climate change. Um, we've seen extreme weather patterns. And climate change is thought to also introduce a whole array of health care issues, 
and the emergence of new pathogens. And I think we've already seen that with COVID-19. And it's predicted that we're not going, this is not the first pandemic, we're going to see more in the future. So of course, laboratories will have to adapt to that. And then last of all, we're going to see, and already are seeing huge technological developments. And most importantly at the bottom here is the emergence of the field of genomics which we have to, as laboratory professionals, take note of. So to get back to disease patterns, because this is definitely going to affect labs, um, on the right here, this is a graph that was published in 2017, which is not such a long time ago. But in fact, I'd like to tell you that probably things have changed a little bit since then. But this graph, um, is uh, on Africa, and um, it predicts the, the healthcare or disease pattern changes from the year 2000 to 2030. And we can see this pink line here is the non-communicable diseases, which has steadily been increasing and is predicted to increase even more by 2030 and beyond. And at the time of writing this article, it was predicted that the infectious diseases, communicable diseases, which have here yeah, HIV, malaria, TB, et cetera, would steadily decrease. But I wonder here yeah, in 2022, how this graph might've changed with the COVID-19 pandemic. And we mustn't forget these other two lines down here. The red one is injuries, trauma, car accidents, which as we get more and more urbanization is also predicted to increase. And then the maternal and nutritional and perinatal disorders is thought to also steadily decrease. So it's often thought that Africa suffers a dual burden of disease. So we sit here in 2022, we've got a high level of non-communicable diseases and still a very high level of communicable diseases. And that places large stress on healthcare and laboratories, and it is going to increase into the future. So my second opportunity or um, uh, challenge, and I definitely think this one is an opportunity, is the advancement in genomics and personalized medicine. So as we, as a profession and the world, increase the knowledge of the human genome, in its role in health and disease, new treatments are being developed with this knowledge that can personalize treatment. And of course, the laboratory plays a huge role in that. But just to show you the evolution of this in laboratories, I think when I trained back in the 80s, we were here in this first block here where Physicians or doctors did a physical examination and they sent an array of tests to a laboratory. We still do this. And the laboratory um, doing biochemical tests, hematology, microbiology would um, assist in making the diagnosis. But as we moved into the 90s, the late 80s and 90s, we started seeing the emergence of cytogenetic laboratories, um, the study of chromosomes, um, and that became very important, particularly in malignancy. And now we are moving into this era where we are doing targeted gene testing. We're doing RT-PCR, qPCR, and this is throughout all the disciplines in our field, uh, microbiology and uh, nematology and other disciplines. And this is becoming quite routine now in laboratories. But we are steadily, and we've seen that during the COVID-19 pandemic, moving into this era, where next generation sequencing, whole genome sequencing, RNA sequencing is becoming the norm. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, now. So this is the future of laboratory medicine in all disciplines. And even going further into the future, and these technologies exist, looking at epigenetics, single cell sequencing, 
looking at cell-free DNA and RNA. So as laboratory professionals, we need to look to the future and be able to educate ourselves and grasp these opportunities in our laboratories. And this slide just takes it a little bit further and introduces another opportunity to it because genomics is becoming the norm, but it's also changing the way we do things in labs. So at the moment, yes, we will always have sample processing. We are going to get the samples from patients. We have to extract our DNA and RNA. We're going to have to practically do the sequencing and DNA analysis or RNA analysis. But this is just the first two steps. The bulk of the processing or analysis lies in big data analysis. First of all, analyzing those DNA sequences. What nucleotides did we find? Then going into identifying mutations. And we've seen that so importantly in the COVID-19 pandemic. We were able to identify different variants of, of the virus. But taking analysis further in humans, in particularly malignancies, what do those mutations do? What are they doing in the cell? So further analysis needs to be done. And then of course, most importantly, with all this data, we have to draw up a report for the physician or the doctor treating that particular patient. So you can see that instead of just doing the test, our profession has now a huge opportunity and a challenge to analyze and interpret data. And that's going to introduce us into a new field called bioinformatics. So in Africa, you can see that um, next generation sequencing and the technology for that is here already. This article was published in The Lancet in 2021 very recent, and it's looking at genomic informed pathogen surveillance. So this is for um, uh, viruses and other pathogens, but I, the technology is there and therefore it can spill over into other disciplines, looking at malignancies, inflammatory disorders. And we can see that the capability for genomic, genomics next generation sequencing is all over Africa. In South Africa, yes, there's quite a large um, capability and most labs are introducing it, but we can see it here. And this is going to grow um, at a fast pace. And I would say even in the next two or three years, we're going to see these blue dots spread even all over the, the continent and grow even larger. So this is a huge opportunity for us to grasp and, and take control over. So, related to this is the, um, the emergence of clinical bioinformatics, because we can generate all this data, this next generation sequencing data and other data, but it needs analysis and interpretation. And uh, bioinformatics is already being performed in South Africa, all over Africa, all over the world. So, just to give you a definition of bioinformatics, and this is taken straight out of the internet so that we understand it, it's a field of science. So it's a new field on its own that uses computers, databases, maths, statistics to collect, store, organize, and analyze large amounts of biological, medical, and health information. So this is even going beyond laboratory data. So here is a beautiful diagram, which I think illustrates it so well. So here you're going to have a professional who has the skills of bioinformatics and will be extracting data from molecular biology, genomics, um, drug designs, pharmaceutical things, other big databases, um, all kinds of big data and interpreting it and um, analyzing it. 
And these are the new skills that I think are going to be required in modern laboratories. So how can we fill these gaps? Well, currently bioinformatics is performed by PhD doctorates, um, scientists who are usually postgraduates, not in our field, but usually have an undergrad degree in genetics or maths or computer science. Um, there are a number of postgrad courses being offered all over the world um, in bioinformatics. But what is really lacking is our discipline of laboratory, medical laboratory professionals, because many of the bioinformaticists lack knowledge in the clinical disciplines of hematology, um, clinical pathology, microbiology, and, and the others. And so when interpreting this huge data, that knowledge is often lacking. And this is something I haven't come up with. It's come up from people in the field themselves. So there is a need for us to start including this in undergraduate courses whether it's a course on its own or within our own um, field is something we can debate. So my third uh, challenge and opportunity, and this is with us already, but it's just going to expand, is machine learning and artificial intelligence. So already our big um, laboratory analyzers um, already introducing algorithms that assist with the diagnosis of a disease, looking at the, the um, lab results that are being produced. And in my field, hematology, identifying abnormal cells. And I'm not talking about a three-part or five-part differential. That's been with us quite a while. I'm looking at deeper analysis of those cells. And these kinds of algorithms are being introduced, particularly in these disciplines. And they use deep learning artificial neural networks. And somebody who's in computer science will understand that far better than me. But they can take cells or images and look at all kinds of parameters within that image not just sizing and um, uh, fluorescence, but all kinds of level, the nucleus, the cytoplasm, the granularity, and are able to classify those cells, not only into what kind of cell, but whether they're healthy, unhealthy, whether they are myeloid, lymphoid, and, do a, and make a diagnosis without human contact. And as the artificial intelligence develops, they are becoming more and more accurate at doing this. And so as a laboratory professional, we need to manage this revolution. And um, because, as we know, we're still going to need some human intervention um, in this whole process of artificial intelligence. So to end off on, on this whole big data and machine learning, this was just a picture I took off the internet, but we can see that the influence of machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data is going to influence laboratories at all stages from sample collection, drones, automate, autonomous vehicles, delivering samples, right through to data analysis and reporting. And you can see all the, all the different types of data coming in to the laboratory. And we as laboratory professionals will have to manage this, this process. Now my fourth challenge or opportunity goes in another direction, and that is point of care testing. This has been with us for a while, and many people don't only see it as a challenge, but in fact as a threat. And I'm going to say not at all. This is most definitely an opportunity. I'm going to take you to this graph on the right, which um, shows it's actually um, being published by a, a sales company, but looks at the point of care instruments that have been sold over 
the years from 2013 to 2022, and they've looked at the various types. And you can see they cover a whole lot of routine disciplines. But for me, what I want to point out is the steady increase in them. It's not a dramatic increase, but from 2013 to 2022, there is a steady increase in point of care instrumentation and um, devices spreading throughout the world in all disciplines. So this is something we have to grasp with. And they are a huge advantage and have several benefits. They're affordable, they're very sensitive, specific, they're quite easy to use. They provide a rapid test, which is a huge advantage. And they are most important delivered right there to those who need it. So laboratory testing at the bedside or point of care, however you want to describe it, point of care could be at a clinic where a patient enters the healthcare system has huge benefits. It provides an early diagnosis and prompt treatment. And that is very important for, for patients and healthcare generally. And so the test result can be delivered right there without having to transport a patient large distances or a sample large distances to a central lab. It's very good in monitoring conditions. And I've just picked out two here, warfarin monitoring. Um, many patients who've had DVTs, thrombosis on warfarin, and you can measure the IMR um, using a point of care device or in diabetic monitoring. And they have a huge reduction in cost. So there's huge benefits to these devices, but they have challenges. Um, these tests are often performed by many different kinds of professionals, not laboratory professionals, but often by a receptionist in a doctor's waiting room or a nurse in a rural clinic or a pharmacist. And many of these professionals don't have laboratory training. And that of course leads to a lack of quality control, which can be very serious and overrule all the benefits of point of care testing if you give an inaccurate result. Um, patients need something that's accurate and that can guide treatment. So here is the opportunity for our profession to grasp because I believe we should be playing a big role in point of care testing. We should be the professionals that are training other professionals to do these tests and um, to be able to handle the quality control and the maintenance of these devices. And I believe as universities and as a profession, we should be developing short courses for um, all these, uh, this array of people who are doing these tests. So the last couple of slides, I'm just going to look a little bit into the future. So, what is the laboratory of the future going to look like? Well, if I read about this, there are two parallel trends. The one is, as you can see from what I've said, the formation of large integrated laboratory or laboratories or laboratory networks, where all these highly specialized tests are going to be consolidated into core facilities. This is already happening. So you would have genomic testing, flow cytometry, and large instrumentation all consolidated into a core facility, generating huge data that is then having to be um, transported back to the hospital or the clinical facilities. But on the other side of the coin is an increase in near patient testing or point of care and a less reliance on central laboratories. So these seem to be opposite in nature, but both important and our profession, the laboratory professionals need to play a role in both of these trends. So here is a integrated laboratory network, and this is already happening in big centralized labs. So instead of um, uh, many of these um, labs, 
the routine practical tasks are going to be done by automation and robotics. And the future lab will need to be very efficient and cost effective because they are going to be generating huge data. And as laboratory professionals, we can see them standing here in purple lab coats, instead of doing the tests, they're going to be interpreting and analyzing the data. And that requires additional skills to what we have at present. So what type of laboratory professional are we going to need? We're going to, our profession is not dying. Many people used to tell me the profession of medical technology and medical science is a dying profession, not at all. But we do have to evolve and respond to these rapid changes because we are the profession that's going to oversee this development in our laboratories. We have to take the bull by the horns and make it happen. And so our focus is going to be on data analysis and integration of laboratory tests. And there's a huge move in the literature that instead of like in South Africa, where medical laboratory professionals choose a specialization in their undergrad degree, there is a move that we would graduate somebody in what we call blood sciences. And this will have all the disciplines, heme, micro, transfusion, chemistry and immunology and, and others. So the graduate would be able to integrate all these laboratory tests. And they would have to understand the pathogenesis of disease understand specialized techniques, genomics, flow cytometry, and others. Genomics, vitally important, and I've put that here because this is increasing at a huge rate. And then some of the other softer skills, problem solving. Not problem solving according to a standard operating procedure, but be a, being able to look at a problem and get solutions from a wide variety of sources, be independently thinking, um, critically evaluate the data that's being generated, and of course, perform research on that data and be innovative. And I think this sort of diagram um, depicts us where we can see professionals being highly versatile and being able to adapt to change very quickly. And so my last slide before I say thank you, how does higher education respond? That's where um, we are um, at, at, in, in, at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology and the University of Zimbabwe and others. So I think we need to look at our curricula very critically with a long-term view, not looking at 2022 or even 2030. We should be looking at what does a person, a professional need in 2050? Um, we need to be including genomics in all disciplines, if not, if, if it has not been done already. Um, we need to integrate more. And um, I know some universities are already looking at this. So a person who gets their undergrad degree has an integrated degree. And that specialization maybe should be offered as a postgraduate qualification. And, um, and for, I know, I think the University of Zimbabwe and other universities really do this, but I'd like to challenge South Africa to perhaps look at this. Bioinformatics, should this be part of the undergrad program? Should we be developing new programs um, uh, or, or do we leave it as a postgraduate? I know at CPUT, we are looking at developing a BSc in bioinformatics. And throughout our training of our students, we need to emphasize critical thinking, not just memorizing techniques or learning how to read an SOP, but to critically evaluate and think about problems. Innovation, and last but not least, at the bottom here is point of care. And that goes beyond our profession. But I think as higher institutions, we need to 
start looking at this in, in a more, and not only for high institutions, but the profession as a whole needs to look at that. So that is where I'm going to leave you and um, hope that I've generated some points for the panel discussion later, which I certainly look forward um, to being part of. And so with that, I'm going to hand over to our chair, um, Ian, if you'd like to take over. And uh, thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Davison, for that interesting discuss uh, the talk on the medical lab sciences future opportunities and challenges and it's interesting that the challenges create lots of opportunities and we are there to continue uh, working and creating a next generation who is able to face the future which is uncertain but is lots of opportunities and this build well into the next uh, uh, presentation by Dr. Aaron Maramba. Uh, Dr. Ma Aaron Maramba, you, may start, you can start sharing your, your slide. Uh, he's going to talk on modernization of medical laboratory sciences career. Dr. Aaron Maramba is the coordinator of the medical laboratory sciences program and is a senior lecturer in, uh, in, in hematology at the University of Zimbabwe. Can you kindly mute your mic? Sonia, can you assist in? All right, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Maramba, can, can you kindly share your, your slide? Uh, thank you, Dr. Manchengola. Whilst he's opening his slides and getting ready for the presentation, uh, I just want to al uh, allude to the fact that we, at the end of these two talks, we are open for discussion, roundtable discussion, for points that have been generated during the, the presentations and uh, as we interrogate the medical laboratory science uh, uh, career opportunity. And uh, also to note that this uh, webinar is being beamed live on Facebook and is also being recorded for those who have missed the, uh, the some parts of the session, you can always uh, use the link that we have shared, uh, Sonia has shared in the, in the chat box, you can always get to the a recording and uh, also to not we'll be able to share with you uh, the, uh, the the presentations so that you can refer to them as well. Uh, over to you, Dr. Aaron Maramba. Uh, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear Hello. you perfectly well. Okay. Th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Machingula, for organizing this. Uh, it's, um, my presentation is going to be on the modernization of medical laboratory science careers. But speaking immediately after Professor Davison, he, she's taken away everything that I was about to say. Because uh, it happened that our presentations are so related, like what uh, Dr. Machingura said. So you find that I see a lot of things that she has mentioned uh, also contained in my presentation. I'll try to put it in a different way, but um, yeah, our audience uh, will pick some other things that may have um, been uh, mentioned already. So my presentation, uh, the overview is, I've decided to go back to the origins of medical lab sciences. He uh, then took it through the history up to now. Uh, what we perceive as challenges or what are regarded as opportunities. So these challenges present us with opportunities to be able to recognize that science is not static and science is ever changing. So we need to approach it in that way. So the, I'll talk about the origins of medical lab sciences, uh, the professional identity. When the profession was developing and uh, people who were in the field, 
we're trying to model the profession into a profession that is e, e, that we could look at as a distinct uh, profession, e, which included recognition by as a profession and the career advancements as we as they faced challenges. So where we are today is as a result of uh, the our predecessors who went through the, those challenges to give us what we have. So the origins of the profession, it, um, it, the field started in the early 1900s. In between 1890 to eight, uh, 1910, women were able to uh, pursue careers in scientific profession. And um, this period leading up to the First World War, uh, women were not involved in war, so they were co-opted into the profession. So clinical laboratories became um, established in hospitals. They started, lab, lab work started in side rooms in uh, hospitals. In some hospitals, when we look around, we can see the side rooms that are there. This was work being done by clinicians or pathologists uh, on the sidelines. And the clinical utility of laboratory tests became more widely recognized by physicians as the, the number of tests increased. So the, when the pathologists were doing this, they had what, in, what they perceived to be the ideal the technician or ideal laboratory scientist, what they must be. So as early as the 1920s, women, as I said, learned that they were particularly well suited for performing laboratory work because of the attributes that they possessed. So pathologists and uh, the lab technicians then also describe that as ideal technician, where the professional, these um, attributes were written in journals. And um, although in reality, what was perceived to be the ideal didn't turn out to be, the relationship between the clinical pathologists who were there before the lab science profession was developed and the laboratory technicians at the time were described this as one of the mutual interdependence between the technicians and the pathologists. However, in reality, the pathologists maintained the strict supervision and control over the work of laboratory technicians. We still see this in uh, many other countries where the separation between the laboratory scientist and the pathologist is not clearly there or where the scientists feel that he, we are living under the limelight of uh, the pathologist. So the real laboratory technician differed markedly from the ideal prototype which was created by the public and the pathologist and uh, by the laboratory technicians themselves. So that's the difference between the ideal and the real thing that was there. So the first clinical laboratory scientist uh, began working in a clinical laboratory shortly after the First World War, which was in the 1914, 1918, thereabout. During the war, for the First World War, and uh, in the years that followed, the critical shortage of the trained laboratory personnel developed because as the profession grew, more tests became uh, co-opted on and uh, there was need for them to get this diagnosis. So we started seeing it coming up. So to alleviate that shortage, pathologists began to hire young women, as I said, training them on the job uh, to perform simple laboratory tests. So the training for the lab personnel, uh, its origin started with training on the job as an apprentice. So this went on for long. As apprentice, most countries training for the laboratory scientists was at a um, diploma level, not to denigrate it to compare to the degree, but uh, the nature of the job needed to be hands on. So it was uh, uh, started as a diploma in many countries. Here in Zimbabwe, where I'm speaking from, um, we had uh, diploma training up to the 1990s when we changed to introduce the first degree in medical laboratory sciences. However, even up to this day, the nature of the diploma training is that it's more like an apprentice kind of training. So the first clinical laboratories and noticeable shortages were driven by the increase in the volume 
and the profiles that came. So the number of tests that needed to be done and the diverse tests that uh, came along. However, there were no uh, established training st standards because the training was being done on the job and uh, there was no benchmarking at the time. So the, that's where we see that there are no established standards there. So a few institutions offered a systematic method of uh, instruction. Basically, like what we see today is uh, SOP. The, this one was meant to have standardization uh, for the training in lab testing. So during the same period, educational programs were established, which were done outside the hospitals. Remember when the profession started, it started in the hospital within that setup, but uh, there was need for the theory to be taught. So that was taken out of the hospital setting to institutions like our universities. So the story that I will tell of the history of medical life sciences will touch what they experienced in America and also the United Kingdom, then coming back to Zimbabwe. So I'm just talking about my experiences of what um, the profession went through. So the profession, the profession which was being developed, the identity was supposed to be um, found. So it started emerging from the 1928 to 1945, where the clinical laboratory science began to develop professional identity of its own. This is coming from the uh, being trained by pathologists. So the achievements that were seen during that period um, included commitment to the development of formal mechanism to serve their specific interests and needs, we, which was supposed to be done or which was done independently from the pathologists. So the pathologists were successful, however, in maintaining the control over other aspects of um, the clinical uh, laboratory scientists. When I did my training in the early 90s, in Zimbabwe particularly, we had the domination of the pathologists labs could not be run uh, by scientists themselves. Uh, pathologists must be at the top. This eventually changed as we went into the 2000s and so on, but that's just politics in the professions. So the beginnings of the profession, the Board of Registry in America, we played a significant role in the early development of clinical laboratory sciences. Having realized that the training was being done in the, on the job, the next thing that was supposed to be done is to recognize the professional was coming out. The board established the standards for competence. Competence is very important thing to benchmark or to be able to reproduce a result. So the board established the standard of competence for entry level practitioners and the mechanism for assessing competence was also developed and um, developed accreditation processes and education programs. So, the recognition of the clinical sciences profession status, which happened in, um, in 1962 to 77. So between these years, the field of clinical sciences experienced many challenges uh, of trying to win themselves off the control by pathologists. In America, they refer them as technologies. So medical technologies in, is um, in supervisory position became more involved in higher management functions, such as organizing and directing laboratory operations. And also the clinical laboratory science educators, because they remember the education was being done outside the hospital. They also developed the graduate programs that would prepare faculty for positions in a two or three year programs, which are, were also the best. So the same period, this records that uh, there was a period of turmoil from uh, the 1962 to 77. By virtue of its close association, because remember the profession started off from the pathologist directions and instructions, making what they perceived to be an ideal scientist or technician. So the association uh, of um, the American Society of Clinical Pathologists then released them and the, there was an association of um, medical technologists which became drawn into a series of legal actions because obviously you watch the pathologists wanted done or what the scientists or technologists were taking up where there was conflict. However, 
all this was um, dropped off. The clinical scientists achieved several victories during the same period of the term war, whereby with respect to certification of our professionals and the mandatory registration with the board. So responsibility of accreditation of educational programs was shifted from the board of schools to the national um, accreditation of our clinical laboratory scientists, which was established. And uh, we also see the national certification agents coming up for the medical laboratory technologies. So, so Yeting realized that the scientists, for them to be recognized profession, we need standardization. This had to be taken into schools, to so the medical training schools uh, came up for medical lab scientists. So trained medical laboratory scientists today, as we speak, are behind a more complex procedure being carried out on person specimens, which is what we call laboratory testing. And there are so many disciplines. Uh, Professor Debson mentioned um, a lot of them. He, sometimes broadly, when we speak, we talk about immunology, immunohematology is blood transfusion. We talk about molecular biology. We also talk about cytotechnology, which is histology in many other cases, microbiology and clinical chemistry. So these are some of the disciplines that we talk about broadly. But as we move in, and uh, remember I'm talking about modernizing, as we are modernizing our professions, we need to go deeper into these uh, the broader disciplines and look at uh, what the challenges that are facing and what we must, how we must respond. So compared to the clinical laboratory technician, who usually have uh, an associate degree, medical laboratory scientists are qualified and certified to carry out more complex procedures. So the career advancement for the bench level scientists, because we call ourselves the technical, technically skilled individuals who are on the bench, but uh, the modernization of careers mean that you we all cannot be sitting at the bench we need to take it at a next level. So depending on the size of infrastructure in the facilities, there are two broad career paths that a clinical laboratory bench scientist is able to explore. We're looking at personal management, personnel management, as well as technical management. So on personnel management, this area may include positions such as the laboratory, operational managers and supervisors. So the responsibilities here for the personnel management will include laboratory budgetary, uh, items, the scheduling of duties, proficiency testing, which is to do with competencies and uh, performance assessments, just to make sure that we have got a cadre who is competent. And um, also looking at higher uh, administrative uh, matters. For many years in the past, the lab scientist or the laboratory professional was behind the scenes. They didn't have the responsibility in administration but we are seeing that change coming up. So when we go to the technical management, uh, some examples of the technical management will include the lead scientist or the technical specialists, which um, in some respects, we also see product specialists if we take it away from the testing environment, but looking at the service provision by the technical diagnostic companies. Um, we also see research and development scientists and quality assurance officers, because quality is key to guaranteeing a good result and the outcomes that we want. So the technical management roles and responsibility also in modern laboratories, this has become highly computerized and automation of equipment has also come in. It has presented opportunities as we would want to say. So these factors now require a network of interface uh, of infrastructure support, which is unique to uh, IT. So the handling of information that is generated in the lab needs a IT system. So scientists have taken up that role instead of getting someone from our side without that background, um, we need to have uh, someone with a scientific background. So in many institutions, laboratories, um, laboratory, the, 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 the scientists uh, are trained on the job in order to bridge the gap between IT and the lab. Because our training in the universities doesn't focus on IT. So you find that when someone has graduated with their degree in uh, laboratory sciences, 
they will be faced with this uh, challenge of handling the data that is generated or managing the results that are coming. So that's where the IT comes in. So we've seen scientists who've graduated and have gone on to work as IT uh, scientists or develop programs that are used for managing information. So further institutions are migrating to new laboratory information systems, which are more compatible with the modern electronic uh, medical records. Here in Zimbabwe, we've got scientists who have gone on to develop lab information systems, which are being used in private labs, and even some of them in public sector. So the results in some institutions um, has been the creation of technical management positions, which is specifically foster the IT and LIMS uh, realm. So educational advancement and certification came in because these challenges are keeping on coming. We are developing the profession. So in general, personnel in clinical laboratories hold university degrees, as I said. Here in Zimbabwe, we moved from diplomas for the highest, for, for, the, yeah, for the basic training for a scientist, we moved from a diploma in the 90s to a degree. Although we also have a cadre who is called um, in Zimbabwe is a technician or state certified technician. In other countries, they call them medical laboratory assistant. Those ones tend to have a lower qualification, but here we, the degree is the um, basic training. So in biological sciences, we can also have others in biochemistry, in clinical laboratory sciences, which um, we have. Uh, so, uh, this may also you may also have people with uh, two year certificates, which are the trainee, which are the technicians in our case, or MLAs in other countries. These have also been trained on the job. The other institutions, you find that a lab that is attached to a hospital or certain institutions, for example, here in Zimbabwe, the blood transfusion the technician is trained on the job. So the institution continues to do that because universities haven't got uh, that qualification offered. So in many institutions, it is highly desirable for management candidates to have a four-year degree or management course, which is lab-related. So positioning in um, possessing an advanced degree, such as a master's, is a common thing here now in Zimbabwe. It's important so because the profession is becoming bigger and bigger. So to match those challenges, people must be highly skilled and more qualified to deal with them. So why do, does lab uh, scientists need to evolve? It has to evolve because it's a science. We are seeing rapid advances in, um, we're seeing rapid advances in science uh, that have been delivered. Uh, we're also seeing change in patient demographics with the aging population, we need to be able to deal with that. So this is also driving the need to deliver services differently and also closer to home, which uh, brings us to how can we deal with that? Uh, it is challenging for individuals to progress with their careers. In the past, when I trained, we used to have a ceiling, maybe because institutions didn't offer qualifications for us to break that ceiling or maybe the structures for administration didn't allow for a medical, medical lab uh, professional to be able to get up to that level. But that has been removed now, or we have fought to remove it. So those challenges between the separation of specialisms also, we, when I trained, we used to have specialists. I think it's important to have those specialisms that are there, but you may find that someone wants to change from one specialism to another. He, because the basic skills are the same. He, we have got uh, issues to do with the lack of structured training for some high skill clinical roles, which we dearly need. We, we, are, we desperately need that. We need to have people who are highly skilled and these um, would have to assist in the profession. So this brings us to the change game. So from the days of waiting for results he, for in minutes, now we're looking at the turnaround times. The turnaround time is determined by the kind of test that we offer and also the importance of the result that we put to it. So reducing the turnaround times by bringing the test near to the patient is key. 
We also have issues to do with reflex testing whereby you do not have to wait for the request to be made. However, they, we still have a challenge where we are not uh, allowed, if it's genetic test, we are not allowed to request tests that do not have a clinician see approval or a test that has not been approved. We also have issues to do with sample sharing. This speeds up the turnaround times by sharing samples. We don't have to go back to the patient. We remove the inconvenience of uh, wanting to rebleed the patient to get another sample to go and do other tests. So the strides that have so far been made in medical labs have improved. Have improved. Um, these are direct response to challenges which have been faced by our predecessors. So where we are is as a result of the work that has been done by our predecessors. When the temperature changes, dinosaurs ceased to exist. So we are seeing the change in temperature. We need to adapt to those changes and move on. E, Dr. Greg, um, Davison talked about the point of care testing, which is some respects are also referred to as near patient testing. So I'll talk about near patient testing in two uh, settings. The first setting is within the healthcare setting. So the benefits that are drawn within the healthcare settings. So the largest benefit is that uh, it can be done rapidly and can be performed by clinical personnel who are not trained in the clinical laboratory. It comes with these challenges, she's already mentioned them. The rapid test results can provide a physician with uh, answers that can quickly help to determine the course of action or how to treat that patient. Uh, this has obviously got benefits in almost any setting. If you consider that in an emergency setting, you don't have to wait for the result to come from the lab, which may be far removed from the setting. So having faster access to the results when being presented with the patient for the first time, this provides the physician with the answers when they are with the patient. And also when they are going to see the patient, the results will be available. It will be there in a matter of minutes as opposed to waiting for the result to come back. We also see the benefits of point of care near patient testing when you are outside the healthcare system. We are talking about mobile testing and uh, monitoring devices that are emerging, which provide advanced care. So the mobile uh, monitoring and self-administration of drugs in patients will provide them with a better quality of life. We're talking about some home-based care where we cannot have a lab located there. So these devices will range from home health monitoring to vital statistics, uh, which are periodic testing, where someone needs to be tested regularly. They can, that can be done at home. So the patients and uh, home care staff are able to perform remote tests and automatically transmit those results back to the healthcare. This is where the IT comes in. This is where we talk about remote access to the results. The testing is done there, but the results come so that they are integrated. So the healthcare employee um, involved, the, involves nurses, healthcare workers, physicians, these are able to view the results which are done away from the hospital setting. So in some cases, agent cases, these devices which are given to be mobile, to be out there in remote, can call an ambulance, which means we are looking at providing them with a better quality of life without them having to come to hospital for testing, but they will just come when the results are available. However, when we compare the near patient testing to the core laboratory setting, we see that the testing can happen rapidly and uh, this can be done by clinical personnel who are not trained. This can also be an obvious uh, detriment to the testing. So we have to step up to the challenge as scientists. So the, most of the personnel conducting the point of care testing, which is what the near patient testing, they are not lab trained personnel, which brings the element of this lack of training in laboratory testing. This implies that the lack of uh, understanding of the lab sciences and uh, the practice for determining the reality of the test. So we need to own this. Where I've worked, the point of testing, the institutions that uh, manage the labs, you've got to take control of the results that are coming there so that they are integrated in the patient record. There's also a lack of knowledge of the particular test method 
which is uh, core to the laboratory, and this includes both pre-analytical and post-analytical. So imagining the person who is testing is not a lab qualified, they don't have an appreciation of the pre-analytical variables in those post-analytical variables. So these processes are key to determine the quality and accuracy of the result. Accuracy is um, one thing that we as uh, scientists, we would like to have in there. So it takes us to the digitalization of the healthcare and laboratory medicine. We are seeing the integration between the laboratory professionals and the clinicians, which would enhance the digitalization. Um, this is being informed by the near patient testing. We want the patients to have their results as soon as possible. How best can we do that? We talk about digitalization. So we've got the internet of things in the mobile health, the world where borders between the point of care and the centralized laboratories will no longer exist because we have integrated the two systems so that the results are all in one. So the availability of diagnostic um, artificial intelligence, which support utilization of the point of care results, which is coupled by the laboratory data comes in because we are using yeah, IT and uh, the digitalization. E, now, and in the near future, or even right now, a new generation of electronic medical records with a digital connection, with digital connection to the point of care, as well as the central area where we do the testing in a massive lab or at the home where we consider patients who are away from the the critical care area. This is merging the healthcare models as uh, proposed by the report from the IFCC, Imaging Technologies Division. The, the central laboratory robotization. So we are talking about automation that is happening in management of results in processing of samples. That's on one side. Then on the other side, we've got a point of care testing extension, which, which is there. So the big data, which has already been mentioned in the algorithm for recording this and reporting an artificial intelligence needs to come in. So it's a challenge to the scientists. It's an opportunity at the same time where we have to handle big data. Results coming from the point of care testing, results from the centralized laboratory and integrate this so that we do not end up repeating and repeating and repeating the tests. The algorithms that have already been talked about who emerge because we have all the data available. It's us there be uh, processing that data and be able to come up with uh, artificial intelligence play to deal with that. So the digitalization of healthcare and the laboratory medicine also currently the healthcare debate which we have leads to the healthcare reorganization strategy. The healthcare setting has to to be reorganized where the hospitals should be devoted to emergencies and intensive care, while the chronic patient is uh, decentralized in communities. We cannot just look at the labs as the labs in centralized places. We must have data that is coming from those communities where the patient is near the patient and the one that is general generated in the centralized place, then that improves the healthcare. Uh, in this slide, the laboratory uh, diagnostic test may be a driver for best medical decision based on the interaction between those. So this uh, may be of value in home to hospital care because patients who are chronically ill cannot be kept in hospital. Those who need critical care must be in hospital, but this must be integrated so that our health care delivery is so good. So the future balance between testing in centralized labs and the testing in the point of care is difficult. It's difficult to predict really because we've got uh, as scientists, our fears that the point of care is not, uh, is not super superintended by a lab qualified individual. It's the responsibility of scientists to try and integrate this information that is coming from the different sides. So new mobile devices and online services uh, in a new context of home, bedside and whatever care must be there so that the data is integrated. And the rise of artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning, which has already been mentioned, can allow the combination of the data and um, from different hospital settings and the point of care testing, as well as the central laboratory. So we've got three places where this 
data is all coming together. We need to look at uh, learning the predictive models um, <clears throat> is a distributed learning. So the synergies between the point of care and the laboratory consolidation is something that we need to think about as we modernize our scientific careers. So availability of large population uh, medical data sets open the way to approaches based on our analysis of data to generate diagnostic hypotheses. We have got all that data. We need to harness the synergies between the two sides. The point of care test area data sets imaged by population diagnostic records derived by area or network laboratory data, um, which means that the, we develop a real world artificial intelligence diagnostic support tool from that information. So in that light, the use of point of care technologies will offer us an opportunity to promote the best use of lab results. We, quality must be also looked at and these results which are generated at the point of care must be integrated in the system. So this approach may be operated in remote, in primary and also secondary diagnostic. And the synergies of laboratory diagnosis between the synergies between the two, the centralized point of care with all real patient diagnostic data available as present in the limbs that we have, uh, we unlock artificial intelligence based on potential diagnostic support tools, now providing a quicker and more accurate and less expensive diagnosis. Less, less expensive in that we do not have to keep on repeating, repeating. Now we have got our algorithms that we have developed by integrating the data sets from those different uh, settings. Uh, so that's the point of care and the challenge which presents uh, opportunities for us to step up to the challenge. Uh, there is something called, uh, we, we, we have got clinical scientists, but we want to improve ourselves to that level of a consultant clinical scientist. Uh, how does a scientist become a consultant clinical scientist? So a consultant clinical scientist is a trend to manage pathology laboratories and services in many pathology uh, specialties. I, I, this is more evident in, um, from my experience in the UK, I'm not sure about South Africa. In Zimbabwe, it's not, we're not that, at that level, but uh, people in the lab sciences aspire to get to that level. We need to have training available for them to get to that level. So this includes uh, toxicology and uh, genetics. We've got consultant clinical scientists who train to the same level as medically qualified pathologists, which now takes us back to where we started with pathologists before the scientists came up. But now the technician became a scientist, technologist, became a, consult a clinical scientist, and now a consultant clinical scientist at the same level with uh, autonomy in their profession. We work together, yes, but uh, as a profession, we're able to stand, alone, to stand on our own and be able to have authority over what is generated in the labs. So combining years of scientific expertise with our training in patient care, the clinical scientists at consultant level will oversee the diagnosis of disease. They will also lead services and guide a wide range of health Care staff. Just like uh, their doctor counterparts, consultant clinical scientists specialize in particular areas. So there are areas where a clinical consultant clinical scientist can uh, specialize in. So we have got um, some established ones. So consultant clinical scientists are essential forces in improving healthcare. They set evidence based standards for laboratories and bring a new technologies in. Uh, because of the changes in demographics, changes in diseases that are coming up, we need to be able to match that by bringing new technologies and scientific methods, which would transform the outcomes of patients. For most, uh, coming, sometimes coming from the research and uh, sometimes in the setting that we have. So consultant clinical scientists who specialize in particular areas, like I say, so we've got our clinical chemistry is well-established in many countries. 
He, same as microbiologist for consultant clinical scientist who is coming from the side of the lab the profession as opposed to a medical person. So that's what we have. He, of late, he, cellular pathology and the hematopathology he, has had challenges in getting lab scientists to upgrade to that level. But um, I'm happy to say that the Royal College of Pathology in England, he now has got a, a framework for the hematology scientists to upgrade to the level of a fellow who is a consultant clinical scientist in hematology. So the examination for the fellow he, for hematology are designed to assess a trainee's knowledge, skills, and behavior in the fields detailed in higher the specialist training. The position of the fellow of the Royal College of Pathology in Hematology is increasingly a requirement for appointment to consultant clinical scientists post in hematology. So these are clinical scientists who are not medically qualified, but in lab best. So clinical scientists is a title which is protected by statutes. Yeah, I'm talking about what they, are, we have in the UK, what they have in the UK and can only be used by individuals who are registered. So the, the changing roles of scientists, as we have seen from the beginning up to now, scientists are involved in the sustainability uh, issues uh, who are closely interact with our stakeholders. So the stakeholders drive this in many respects either from experience. It is insufficient to only provide knowledge or evidence to these stakeholders. We need to take them on board because they might experience that the traditional role of scientists is not appropriate anymore. Actually, it's not appropriate anymore. If we stay where we were and considering how science has moved, we will be left out. So stakeholders are experts themselves in their field and can take up important roles in problem definition, which is giving us a reality check as scientists. Thank you very much for listening. I rest my case. Thank you very much, Dr. Maramba, for that interesting presentation. And uh, we have had two presentations, and I'm sure there is some uh, uh, issues to dissect further. So uh, in the chat box, I do not see any anyone uh, who has posted a, an an input or a question. So I'll open up to anyone who would want to have something to, to, uh, to add or a question yeah, about the medical laboratory career opportunities, where we are going and where we see ourselves going as, as medical laboratory professionals. It's, it's in, uh, I see Abu Bakr Tuku is raising uh, their hand. So we'll ask you to unmute. Can you unmute? Can you unmute your mic? Yeah. Yes. All right. I you can go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much for this great presentation and uh, it's really enlightening. I'm calling from Kano, Nigeria. Uh, my plea is uh, I happen to be the chairman of the Professional Association of Medical Laboratory Scientists here in Kano. And I would like our professional association to have more collaborations of this kind of webinar so that it will reach to, I mean, so that we have more reach to our members because there are a lot of issues that we are left behind here. And uh, uh, the other question is about becoming a clinically a clinical consultant, laboratory consultants. I don't know, is it post how, what are the requirements and what are the link? I've learned from the presentations that it is being done in South Africa here in Africa. So we would like to hear more on how someone become clinical medical laboratory scientist. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. 
thank you very much, uh, Abu Bakr Tuka. And uh, it's uh, the reason why we, we, we put together this consortium is to ensure that we share knowledge and, and how to improve as as the medical laboratory professionals in 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 Africa, and uh, the, the, I've shared my email. You are uh, feel free to jot me an email so that at least I'll add you on my mailing list uh, when we are when we have a webinar, and uh, we try also to retain the 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 emails of. Uh, colleagues who have attended previous sessions and we alert them when there is the next session. But please do disseminate the information as widely as possible. And, uh, and uh, we, 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 ins we ensure that we, we, sh we share this as a recorded uh, session so that all those who haven't attended can also be able to get the information and uh, learn from one another. And uh, I would want to put it across to my colleagues who have presented uh, to comment on the, the consultant issue. Uh, maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Maramba, then uh, Prof. Davison. You can comment. Thank you, Dr. Mashingula, and uh, thank you for the question, uh, Abu Bakar. I, my experience, I, I've worked in the UK, I've worked in Zimbabwe. I can only talk about the experiences in those countries. As far as South Africa is concerned, I'll probably refer to Professor Davison. I, the, one, the, the, the system that works in the UK is straightforward, as I said in my presentation. It's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's the training is done through the Royal College of Pathology. There's a pathway in the examinations that are um, done with the Royal College of Pathology. So you need to be a scientist with a, with a degree or specialism that you want, uh, then you follow the training program. That's uh, what I can say about uh, the becoming a consultant in the uh, using the Royal College of Pathology in England. Okay. And as far as Zimbabwe is concerned, we haven't got a program yet. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Maramba. And, uh, uh, Prof. Davison, would you want to add anything? Um, uh, yes, a little bit. I am very, very happy to hear that the UK has included hematology as part of their program, because I know they hadn't before. But as far as South Africa is concerned, we do not have a proper program for a medical lab scientist to become a clinical consultant scientist. And I think that in South Africa, we're a long way off. Um, pathology, pathologists actually still are, um, see themselves as very dominant. And um, yes, I think our profession as well has a long way to go um, in, in realizing that and putting those programs into place. So uh, uh, this is not available in South Africa, but it is, uh, uh, I think, a very enlightening thing and um, I think it's something as Africans we should be looking into together and, and, and perhaps introducing it here as well. So that's my comments. Thank you very much, uh, Pro Prof. Davison and Dr. Maramba. Just also to add, to say, uh, the coming together of us as African practitioners help us to exchange knowledge and learn from one another and learn what's happening in other countries which we can benefit us as practitioners in Africa. And we, we send a good, a, good, a, a good position to be able to change the way we do business. Because remember, we are the ones who affect the policies in our, uh, in our, in our, in our, in our profession. Uh, per se, because we are the ones who are involved in 
in in in our health uh, professions authorities we, we we have an input in there as well so we sh we, we also stand a chance to be able to in initiate the, the dialogue towards where we we where we where, where we want to go and where we believe would benefit the the population and uh, it's good that we we can share the knowledge and share the uh, the experience and as also as uh, as academic institutes which are also facilitating this we are able we should be able now to ensure that the training programs that we are now thinking of or a design would address some of these issues so it's good that we can begin brainstorming over this so it's very essential that we begin this dialogue and and uh, take the the next step and the next step involves changing policies and also the training institutions responding to that uh, Bernard, uh, Bernard Bondo had, in, had raised this end. Are you still, do you still want to say something? We will unmute Mr. Bernard Bondo. Can you unmute your mic? Hello. Bernard. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, I have an interest in uh, integration. As uh, it was been put, put across that uh, we can integrate uh, medical laboratory and the ICT. Uh, I just wanted to ask, is it feasible to have uh, ICT uh, part in, a, in the programs that we, 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 we learn in a, in our colleges or also have them as a part of uh, trainings in a professional development careers so that we can uh, have a lot of people who have the ICT knowledge and also who are working as laboratory technician or technologist or laboratory scientist to be able to make some other programs which uh, which uh, most of the times like the issue of limbs and the, and, and the and the computer that we, we also ask the IT guys and also some other people who are non-lab personnel to work on so that we can at least make use of the stuff that we have and also make, we make, make, make it available to everyone. I just wanted to ask on that. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard Bondo, for that. I will put it to the to to the panelists, I'll start with uh, Prof. Davison, then go to Dr. Maramba. Yes, thank you for that question. And that is a very thought-provoking question because I think it is becoming essential for us to include these IT skills. At the moment, I think we do have computer literacy and this sort of thing in our programs, but it's got to go further than that. And I'm talking, uh, I think, about bioinformatics, the interpretation of all this big data and what Dr. Marumba talked about, integrating all this data coming from point of care, uh, et cetera. So I say to you, yes, even... Um, uh, I don't, I, and I'm not sure how, and I'm going to open this and I'd love to hear Dr. Marumba's opinion. Um, we, I think they, it must be incorporated into our courses. But I also think we need to look at um, perhaps a specialization in bioinformatics because I think it's growing at such a rate. There's a need for um, clinical bioinformaticists to process data from all of these places, interpret it, analyze it. Um, but I think uh, would, on, on a different level. So um, my answer to you is yes. The how, though, is perhaps something that this group could talk about. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I would like input from, from everybody there. So can I hand back to you, Ian, and maybe Dr. Marumba can add to the, the debate. 
Yes, thank you, Glenda. Uh, Dr. Maramba, can you add, add on that? Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Machingola. Thank you for the question. Uh, my, my, my addition, I, I'm happy that our project is on talked about uh, the bioinformatics because that's a new area in our world here, but it's been developed in other countries. And the, that area needs to have scientists trained on. As far as the training is concerned or integration is concerned in Zimbabwe, at undergraduate level, we have got very little the material taught at undergraduate level. The argument is our programs are already overloaded. So what has happened is, for example, in the University of Zimbabwe, we have got an undergraduate program, which is called Medical Analytics and Informatics as an undergraduate. Then there's also a postgraduate program where scientists who have trained in medical lab sciences can go on and do a master's program there. On, uh, as far as that is concerned. Uh, as far as uh, developing uh, limbs, I have got uh, examples from Zimbabwe, as well as the UK of scientists, medical lab scientists, we have gone on to specialize in um, lab information systems, but as a postgraduate training program. So my answer would be in short, uh, as far as the current undergraduate program is concerned, there seems to be an overload on the material. Yes, it's important to have an appreciation, but uh, as far as incorporating it to the level that we would want, it is a bit difficult. So we can take it as an additional training or postgraduate training. Thank you. Thank you very Dr. much, Dr. Maramba, and thank you, Prof. Davison. I'm also of the school of thought that at undergraduate level, uh, we, pro we produce a generalist who has as much uh, of ev everything as possible, which enables them to be a practitioner. Then at specialization now, we can be able to, to, to allow them to specialize in a field at mastery level. So that's my school of thought. But at least if someone has the basics, they can even utilize that basics even to design something. That's also another uh, school of thought as well. But specialization should be open at mastery level, even up to doctoral. Okay, just to add to that, I, I agree with you, Ian. I'm also more and more becoming um, of the thought that specialization should be postgraduate, the intense specialization. Um, and I think in that sense, the University of Zimbabwe is um, ahead of, of us in South Africa. May, may I also add that um, the, 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 the member who asked the question, maybe they could, um, if they want links with the fellow scientists who have gone on to do uh, IT, trailers in IT, they could, uh, through the organizer, Dr. Machingura, he ask for contacts. If that can help, if that can help, rather. That's a, a, a excellent uh, idea. I think we've lost Ian. Um, I don't know if he's going to try and join us again. I think it's connected with problems, I suppose. Um, hi, all. Uh, I think Ian, he lost his connection. I can see um, there is other participants who would like to ask a question. I'm just putting you on a mute. You can ask your question, Yusuf.
Yusuf, can you unmute yourself, please? Yusuf Uthman Sheriff. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, okay, you. thank you, sir. Sure. Sorry, I was connected to a Bluetooth device. <laughs> That's the, uh, like I was saying, I said, my name is Yusuf Sharif. I'm a laboratory technician. I'm also a laboratory student from Sierra Leone. Um, I want to thank the panelists, the, the, the host, and the presenters for this webinar. You know, it's, it's, it's an eye opener for some of the presentation that the first presenter did. Um, um, like, like the last presenter was saying, over the years, there are no post um, 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 degree courses for laboratory sciences in Sierra Leone. But since the outbreak of Ebola, the institution now have adopted medical BSc honors in medical laboratory sciences and also public health laboratory sciences courses in Sierra Leone. So, uh, however, there are still some areas that I think we 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 still lack in the laboratory mm -hmm. field for students. Like if the next gene sequencing, the first presence I was talking about, those things you will never we've never learned them in 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 school, and unless after graduation when you have when you when you've started working, or you have some you're fortunate to attend some training programs some workshop there, that was the time you start hearing stuff like that, next gene sequencing, whole genome sequencing. And for me, I'm really passionate about that. I would like to know more about sequencing. I was, I'm just requesting if this organizer, the, 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 if we can have a pre-online courses on next gene, next genome sequencing, which the, I'm sure that will, that, that will give, that will enable other laboratory students or laboratory professionals who do not have any idea about it to learn more about it. The secondly, I would like to, to suggest if as an as an African as a whole, if we can have a student body purely for laboratory sciences or biomedical laboratory sciences, one student body in Africa, which I like whenever we'll be having, we'll be organizing seminars where seminars from one region to another, then people will be interacting, they'll know ourselves more. So those are the things that those, that's, those are my concerns. All right, thank you very much, Yusuf. Uh, I would ask uh, Prof. Davison and Dr. Maramba to to say uh, to respond on that one. I'll, I can respond on the uh, and I think what Yusuf is raising is really excellent on the next generation sequencing um and yeah um i'd like to suggest perhaps a, a, a webinar on that um at cput we do have people who could present at such a webinar um on what it is and and the yeah. base and the technologies um and i know that um prof matcha who heads up our unit and the, is the dean she often has wet workshops on next generation sequencing but obviously then you would have to be present but i do think um uh, uh, the offering of a webinar and if ian is here i heard his voice um for for future might be a a, a very good idea you know um, and certainly uh, we would uh, participate that. And then to comment on your second suggestion of having a student body, I cannot think of anything better. I really think that it's time um, Africa worked together. And that's from student level, um, sharing experiences because your experiences in Sierra, Sierra Leone are very different to ours. But I can tell you now, we can learn from your experience with Ebola and how to control um, um, that. So I think having a student forum, and Ian, if you're listening, is a, a really excellent idea. Um, so those are my comments on, on that. I'm so glad you raised that. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Davison. Dr. Maramba, would you want to comment uh, on that one? 
Dr. Maramba. Uh, hello, yes. Uh, I, I think he, uh, Prof. Jefferson <laughs> nailed it. I, uh, it's very important for us to, to, to collaborate, especially as Africans, so that we, 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 we have got similar systems or uniform sort of system. We, we learn from uh, other. I know South Africa is uh, way ahead of, ahead of most of our African countries, but we can benefit from collaborations with um, the specialists in South Africa. Thank you very much. Just to comment, we're not way ahead on, on everything. Um, Dr. Maramba, and I think sometimes in education of our professionals, I think Zimbabwe mm -hmm. has in fact taken the lead there. So um, we can learn from you as well. Thank you. Yes, Prof. Prof. Glenn uh, uh, Davidson, that's uh, that, that's uh, where we, we 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 the whole essence of this collaboration is to ensure that we can share as much as we can share. And the, 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 the view or the vision of the consortium is to set up a center of excellence, but also allow to, to use our online to be able to share knowledge and skills. And with the coming in of technology, we are on webinars and we are also able to share even the genomics uh, practical hands on uh, on uh, knowledge and uh, and skills via uh, we we webinars as well so that, that's that's essential i have shared my email address we will be i'll be very glad to link the students and uh, so that they can also link with the the Students Association in Zimbabwe and the Students Association in, in, in South Africa, Nigeria, in all the African countries that are that are part of the consortium, so that the students can also begin working together. Because uh, I remember we, my relationship with uh, 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 Prof. Davison, Prof. Macha, Prof. Erasmus started even when I was a student, and it grew even now that we are. Uh, we are older so we would want that also to to come those eyes who are raising their hands so just say so in conclusion we have two 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 uh, two guys who are raising their hands. May you kindly uh, unmute, starting with uh, uh, Yusuf, you have already said, so I think it's only one. So, Dika Ahmad Ziripi, in conclusion, do you, uh, you can hear what you want to say before we close. Um, okay, thank you for the platform. I uh, just wanted to thank the two speakers for uh, what they presented today. It was very insightful. Um, I have a question. I'm a student at UCT studying um, in the Division of Forensic Medicine. So I wanted to ask that is there actual evidence that physicians or doctors or even pathologists require, let's say, genomic data in their diagnosis? Or is it something that at present we want to advance in order to um, sort of be at par with the rest of the world? Uh, thank you. All right, uh, we, we can ask Dr. Maramba to go in first, then Prof. Davison. Uh, that's our last question. Hello. Yes, you can go ahead. Um, I think I, I missed the first part of the speaker's um, question because my connection was uh, poor, I think. You, can you just repeat for me, Dr. Machingura, or we can pass it on to Prof. Davison? All right. You was asking the okay. uh, genomics, its use uh, in, in, in diagnosis. Is it something that is uh, current or that 
Hi, Ian. I can I can take it. I hope um, Dirk and everybody. So whilst you are, you can also ask Prof. Davison to say something. Okay, I will I will say something. Um, thank you, Dirk, for that question, and I think it's an important question. Okay, I've unmuted myself. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, uh, Duke, that's a very important question. And yes, genomics is being used in diagnosis. And I think as laboratory professionals, we also need to educate clinicians of the benefits. Um, let's just take COVID-19 for an example. Genomics has been essential in tracing the virus, identifying the various variants, and that is doing understanding the, the um, sequence of the virus and being able to trace that as through the two years that we've had the pandemic, they've been able to very early on identify the emergence of a new variant. So certainly in pathogens, viruses, etc., genomics and um, genetics is taken hold. In malignancy, and here's where I come from, and Dr. Marumba as well, um, hematological malignancies, leukemias, genomics is, is fast taking precedence, especially with personalized medicine, the identifying of genes um, that can be targeted for therapy. And I'm just going to mention one, chronic myeloid leukemia, um, the treatment has been revolutionized because of genomics being uh, put into the, the diagnosis of that disease. So the, in answer to your question, yes, genomics is being used in Africa um, all uh, and increasing in Africa in the diagnosis and treatment of, of diseases. I hope that has answered your question, but please feel free to um, add to it. Oh, well, thank you for that. There's not much that I can add. I remember the purpose of diagnostic, we look at patient outcomes. As she, Prof. Davison rightfully said, for the right medication to be given and for us to, when you do prognostication, when you do minimum residual diseases, we need to be able to do uh, genomics. That's very useful in, um, in the management of patients. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Davison, and thank you, Dr. Maramba. Yes, genomics is uh, currently being used and it's actually will be used more. And in, in that uh, light, I would like to thank you uh, all for attending, starting with the presenters. Thank you, uh, Prof. Davison. Thank you, Dr. Maramba, for taking your time in preparing preparing and also we want to thank our colleagues from uh, empower uh, school of health for they are taking our backup sonia and the team and colleagues from the Africa Federation of uh, all the uh, let's enjoy the rest of the day thank you very much and happy lab week yes and thank you to you Ian I hope you can hear me Dr. Mashangura for um, uh, uh, spearheading this consortium. It is very valuable and I would like to personally thank you for your effort. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure and thank you for your contribution to the consortium.
we would uh, we'll, together we can achieve more thank you very much <laughs>